Okay. Do you want to join share your uh, your slides and uh, and the presentation uh, mode so we can. Uh, All right, uh, we will uh, start uh, momentarily. It's a good chance for everyone to get into the uh, Zoom room. Uh, no, you, you should have the polls, uh, Dr. Shusha. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, oh, it's, is it not? Uh, where we'll be starting momentarily, just have a, a minor technical problem. You are the host, which is fine. Uh, and you're right, I don't uh, see the polls as well. You have, um, they just disappeared. Okay, you have yeah, them? I, I got them. You got them? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Do you want to go on a presenter view or because your slides market? Okay, perfect. I think we can start right now. Good morning and uh, welcome everyone to uh, the uh, Department of Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Uh, Shusha. Dr. Shusha is an assistant professor in the Division of Neurology in the Department of Medicine. He specializes in MS, NMO, and autoimmunity. Uh, he attended medical school in Cairo University in Egypt and finished uh, his training at King uh, Faisal Specialist uh, Hospital and Research Center, Center in Riyadh, followed by fellowship in MS and uh, NMO uh, and neuroimmunology disorders at Western University in London, uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and Mayo Clinic in uh, Minnesota. He's uh, a board member of the International Clinical Consortium on NMO, and uh, he has several novel publications in the field of MS and NMO, and uh, he's a reviewer of multiple uh, uh, peer-reviewed uh, journals. Uh, he works out of the MS uh, clinic out of the Hamilton uh, General, and he's going uh, talk to talk to, to us today about uh, autoimmunity in neurology and what happened to Monday. So, uh, Aslam, uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, good Dr. Azam, for your kind introduction, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted uh, to join the Medical Grand Round for today. And um, maybe I should start by the land acknowledgement that I want to acknowledge that I'm suited upon the traditional territories of the uh, tradition of Mississauga. And this land is um, uh, covered by the, uh, the Dish With One uh, Spoon Wampum Agreement. And whatever you are, please take a moment to reflect and give thanks for those who will come before you on the land on which you currently reside. Okay, and I think a second acknowledgement and, and um, a thankful for, for the uh, members of the Department of Medicine for their great contribution to help us as a neurologist in the service um, either in the Hamilton General Hospital or the St. Joe's. Um, as a new member for the Department of Medicine, year, unfortunately due to the COVID, I didn't get the chance really to, uh, to meet uh, everyone, but I'm so delighted for the people that I dealt with during my uh, uh, coverage in the CTU. So uh, uh, today we'll talk about the central uh, nervous system neurology manifestation and rheumatological disease and what happened to Monday. I don't have any financial disclosures. However, we might highlight some of the off-label use medications. So uh, to start with, we have a couple of questions um, before we move to the cases that um, a different flavor from my practice at the MS uh, clinic. Uh, so the first question is, isolated neurosarcoidosis can be present in around 6%, 12, 17, or 22%. I will um, uh, launch the poll, please participate. We'll give a couple of seconds. Okay, we have um, the majority voted for the 12%. 
Uh, and then we have another questions. So the bagel sign on the spine MRI indicating neurosarcoidosis myelopathy or passive disease myelopathy, Jogren syndrome myelopathy, or anti-MOG uh, myelopathy. Okay, share the results. So then we have a diversity of the majority voted for the anti-MOG and the patchet. And the third question, the commonest neurological manifestation in Jogren syndrome, is it fatigue, neuropathy, myelopathy, or optic neuritis? Okay, that's great. So we have the majority went for the mental fatigue and the second um, uh, answer would be in the percentage as the neuropathy. Okay, so I have one more, dino Suzak syndrome. Okay, so we have the more than 90% with the answer no. So this would be given opportunity to uh, highlight about that disease entity. And the last question, we're testing um, um, different types of knowledge here apart from the scientific knowledge. Do you know who is she? Okay, great. So it seems we have a lot of young generations in the department. Okay, so we're moving forward to the, um, to the talk. So neurological manifestation and rheumatological disease, actually the, the, they are common and they are sharing, um, and the, they are shared among all the rheumatological disease. We can't really point any uh, specific neurological manifestation either in the central um, uh, uh, nervous system or the peripheral nervous system with the, and the all the rheumatological aspects. This would be including the uh, demyelination or inflama inflammation in the brain, brain coma, and the spinal cord. Uh, we might have some uh, vascular insults or um, a stroke. We might have the vasculitis. I um, would have the axonal involvement or sometimes the demyelinating involvement. And even among the rheumatological disease themselves, I'm not the expert to speak about that, but having the skin manifestations, the joint manifestations, even the blood work, we have shared a lot of serological markers that they can be on different um, uh, rheumatological entities. And the biopsy sometimes might not be really helpful. This reminds me with the movie called What Happened to Monday, which the, the having a seven um, uh, twins uh, or separates of the of a family that they named them according to the to the weekdays. So the if you if we track the rheumatological disease with the rheumatoid arthritis, the Jogren, the Pachet, the systemic lupus, and behind it sometimes we have the antiphospholipid syndrome and the sarcoidosis. 
they look like the same in their presentation and the neurology. And sometimes it might trick us or deceive us or which one I am dealing with, with the overlapping with the antibodies or the, the symptoms um, uh, as well. If you notice here, we're having six. So what is Monday? So Monday would be the vasculitis which can really present with among of them. It would be out of the, uh, of the, to the topic that's for today. So I'll start with the, the, with the um, um, I'm showing different cases from the clinic that they referred with the impression of multiple sclerosis. But when we dive into details, we found it's not, it's not really the diagnosis. So the first case, I have um, a 57 year old female that she was presented in the summertime of last year with imbalance and diplopia for one week. And within a couple of weeks, she started to have a visuospatial deficit. She was, she found lost in the park while she's going for a walk and her husband couldn't um, um, realize why she was unable to come back home. And after this one incidence, within a couple of, of, of days more, she started to have short memory uh, loss and she mixed up her schedule and she started to have a behavior changes and appropriate laughs which was assessed in the emergency in a referral hospital and spinal fluid analysis showed seven cells, protein is high and normal glucose and negative oligoclonal bands and unremarkable infectious uh, workup. So the MRI of the brain, um, if you can identify here, we're seeing periventricular lesions, cortical lesions and cerebellar lesions where they are really typical in their geography and topography for multiple sclerosis. And the patient was referred to the clinic. She was started with a steroid, which showed dramatic improvement for her behavior changes. And she was referred to the clinic with the impression of multiple sclerosis. But when we dug more in the detail of the imaging, we identify the patient as a high signal antennas in the corpus callosum, and one of them as uh, active. So, when we evaluated the patient, we, we had, this is the behavioral changes as really an atypical presentation for multiple sclerosis. Even if we having atypical lesions in the brain, but that pres presentation um, uh, makes us stepping a couple of steps back. Okay, let us cross these dot eyes. Are we really dealing with multiple sclerosis here with this atypical uh, presentation? Um, I suspected the patient might have something called Suzak syndrome because we're having this snowball appearance in her MRI. When I tried to, to look for the other common manifestation besides the, um, the encephalopathic picture for Suzak syndrome, she didn't have any visual symptoms, any hearing loss. However, this is not really a mandatory to make the, 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 the diagnosis. Considering the presentation, we went further to make sure that she did, were not dealing with autoimmune encephalitis. The panel came back unremarkable. MRI spine was normal. And I referred her for a, the, an, a colleague, ophthalmology colleague, when they found a segmental thinning of the retinal arteries. And her CT chest abdomen bulbus to make sure that we're not dealing with a paraneoplastic um, a manifestation came and showed um, the, the, the guest uh, tumor for her GI. So we made a diagnosis of uh, a Suzak syndrome based on, on the, or her uh, uh, confusion manifestations and the brain involvement, the, um, the, even the asymptomatic features in her retinal arteries. And maybe I would like to highlight what is Suzak syndrome and what is the diagnostic criteria about it? So the syndrome, it's one of the autoimmune mediated disease that is affecting the small vessels, either in the brain or in the retinal arteries or in the ear. And the triad or the commonest triad for that is encephalopathy, um, uh, decreased vision or retinal manifestation, or uh, at the same time, vestibulocular involvement. That's to say this triad is only common in 13%. And Upon that, the proposed diagnostic criteria for having a definite or a probable uh, or maybe an, a possible Suzak syndrome. If we go into details for that, and I highlighted a couple of the, of the things that's very important uh, for patients uh, for, to, to, to be aware of when we diagnose patients that K2 
clinical findings in, in the retinal involvement is not really required. And we might have the use of the fluorescein and angiography to evaluate any uh, ischemia in the retina and looking for any segmental thinning for the retinal artery involvement. The same thing for the, um, for the vestibular cochlear, if the patient might have new onset tinnitus or hearing loss or vertigo, an audiogram might be really helpful for that. In addition to the brain involvement, the new cognitive impairment or behavioral changes or new onset headache, and then the commonest finding can be the snowball appearance that the one that I highlighted briefly, but at the same time, uh, typical MS uh, lesions can be found and there, in the literature, there are several cases that they were misdiagnosed as multiple sclerosis and then they just turn to be uh, Sozak syndrome. In the treatment, the initial modality first line always the same as we're using with the steroid. They showed an, um, an dramatic improvement with a steroid and the patient would require, the, the disease is established, uh, would require a long-term uh, immunosuppressant. Interestingly, this patient, after she was evaluated by the, uh, the GI team and the oncology team for regarding her guest, so they decided to go for imipitinib, uh, which is the PTK inhibitor, and the patient, the repeated images for the patient showed improvement in her lesions, and now we're working to report this as using the PTK inhibitors for treatment Suzak syndrome um, uh, as a first uh, case report. So I'm moving to another case, um, uh, which is outside HHS uh, during my practice years ago. This is 25 year old Asian male that presented with parparesis progressed over two weeks along with urine retention and symptoms classically suggestive of myelopathy and improved with, the, with two courses of um, high dose of steroid for 10 days. The initial course with the patient was refractory to add. And the patient had a right-sided uveitis six months prior to that. There was unremarkable history for any optic neuritis, um, 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 uh, sick syndromes or, or sick symptoms, or genital ulcers, no skin lesions, no joint involvement, no symptoms of intractable nausea vomiting hiccups, so just of area prosema syndrome and no respiratory um, manifestations, neither constitutional symptoms. Spinal fluid analysis, if you can appreciate, we had um, a neutrophil predominance and um, a positive oligoclonal band and the vasculitic workup um, along with the NMO, MOG and the autoimmune uh, uh, myelitis panel came back unremarkable as well. So this is, this is the patient MRI of the brain and you can appreciate um, some leptomeningeal enhancement, but in the, in, the, uh, in the MRI of the spine, we can appreciate a high signal and density regions here, and we found a low signal within it. So if we look to the, to the axial cut for, the, uh, for that um, uh, myelitis, we can, we, can, we can see that the central high signal intensity regions within, um, um, we can see a low signal intensity regions within a high signal intensity regions. And this is, looks like the, um, the, the bagel sign. And uh, uh, the patient, the pathology test was done for the patient and was positive. And the patient was given the diagnosis of neuropathic. Uh, this is the, the, the proposed um, uh, diagnostic criteria that and the, some of the, the uh, experts, they use the old one, and there is an updated to the 2004, and there is a 2006 as well, but it's not a standard in all the, the centers. So if we collectively, if we have a four points from uh, the, the updated one, this would give the diagnosis, and this for, for this patient, um, uh, he, the, he was given that diagnosis. Those were uh, some of the, um, um, the rheumatological manifestations or the, the extra uh, uh, CNS manifestation, including the, the scans, the ulcers, the uveitis, and the other scan uh, manifestation and the pathology test uh, positive. So the neuropathic uh, symptoms, common is that we, we know that the, well, the, the commonest area would be involved in the brain is the brain stem but the commonest manifestation would have um, a diversity with the headache, 
uh, neurological deficits or uh, acrineuropathy and myelopathy, or even to some extent, some of the cognitive and behavior uh, uh, changes, and to less, to less extent, optic neuritis and uh, seizure and peripheral neuropathy involvement as well. Those are examples of the CNS involvement in the in neuropathy. You can appreciate here the, the, the patchy lesion uh, in the brain stem, and that is different from the MS lesions. MS lesions usually presented as a peripheral, peripherally, located peripherally in the, uh, in the brain stem. Um, I, another example for the cortical or the subcortical involvement of neuropathy disease and the, um, the, the, the involvement of the deep gray matter as well. And the enhancement pattern, uh, it can also sometimes uh, confuse with the enhancement pattern of multiple sclerosis with the C shape facing the cortex. Bigel sign was discovered by um, um, Oglu, he's a Turkish uh, neurologist, um, and um, um, uh, work, he worked with them, uh, my clinic team, and uh, they, they described the Bigel sign for Pachet um, uh, myelopathy a couple of years uh, ago. So the third case, that we have a 39-year-old female that in June of last year, after she received her first um, uh, COVID vaccine dose, within a week, she had symptoms suggestive of myelopathy or myelitis, including a numbness, growing up to her torso and weakness uh, and both uh, lower limbs. And she was evaluated in the ER uh, with, the, uh, with an MRI showed myelopathy. And um, she was treated with a steroid and the symptoms improved partially. And within a couple of, of weeks later, she, start, she had another uh, symptoms with imbalance uh, involvement. She was uh, also referred to the clinic with the impression of uh, multiple sclerosis based on the lesions that she had and the presentations. So we appreciate here the typical periventricular lesions. And in addition, we're having an infratentorial and uh, spinal cord uh, lesions. So, uh, but the, the, when we want to the, for the further investigation with this patient and further history, although that she mentioned that she, she has um, some dryness in the mouth and the eye and um, the serological markers for her, the anti-SSP was slightly elevated. Um, uh, oligoclonal bands were positive for this patient. I referred her uh, for the rheumatological colleagues to, to look for and if those if are really dealing with a Jugendhund syndrome or this is, those markers are only an association with, the, um, uh, with a multiple uh, sclerosis. I usually send for all the patients that were present with the multiple sclerosis, even if they do not have any symptoms suggestive of rheumatological disease, I sent for the, for the uh, rheumatological markers because we might have an association uh, for that, or it might indicate um, uh, another um, uh, disease uh, entity or only an, a, a silent association or asymptomatic association with the serological markers. Uh, the rheumatology initially, they thought the, the level of the, S, uh, the SSP is not truly really, um, uh, triggering a bell or ringing a bell uh, for uh, Jogra syndrome. Uh, however, considering the, her symptoms of the dryness in the eyes and the mouth, we proceeded with the lab biopsy, which came back confirming um, a Jogren uh, syndrome. So the, the commonest Jogren, the, there are misconceptions that the commonest uh, manif neurological manifestation, Jogren syndrome, is a neuropathy. But this group is really highly educated but this is not really the situation. The mental fatigue and the physical fatigue is the commonest manifestation. It's, our, it's almost touching 50% of the, of the extra rheumatological manifestation that for Jogren syndrome, mental fatigue are contributing as a 50% along with the headache. Neuropathy is contributing around only 22%. Uh, percent. So long extensive myelitis can be um, a presentation of Jogren syndrome, the involvement of the, of the, uh, the temporal, temporal loops, and in addition, 
they have uh, something called MS-like uh, legions with the atypical, the patient that I shared, she had a typical legions for MS and she had a typical relapsing pattern for MS. So it can be an overlap. Both entities can overlap and would, wouldn't be able to differentiate unless that we move really to uh, a brain biopsy. So we decided to treat this patient um, with the anti-CD20 from the, from the neurology side as she was evaluated lately by the by the rheumatology and along with the with the communication with the colleagues that um, we might consider other uh, drug entities like cyclophosphamide um, if the patient didn't show improvement on the anti CD20 medications. The dilemma of the of the Jogren syndrome uh, along with the MS that they are, we have really a poor serology sensitivity. Um, they, are the, 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 uh, they are touching maybe around 50% of the, of, their, of the results. And at the same time, the ambiguity of the, of the symptoms and the, the atypical manifestations that they can be overlapped with a lot of, of, uh, of, uh, of patients. Dry eyes, dry mouth, not really a necessity to have the, uh, the diagnosis. And uh, sometimes lip biopsy can confirm for patients that they don't have symptoms, but only a positive serological markers. And in addition, the, the disturbance only on the, on the cells and arrangement on the lip biopsy can be suggestive, even if we don't have a definite um, um, uh, findings towards the, uh, the, the, the Jogren syndrome. And um, I'm sure our um, uh, rheumatological uh, colleagues would have a, a, a better input regarding uh, that first line treatments, you do as any other uh, neuro, um, uh, autoimmune uh, disease, we use the steroids, the IVIG, uh, and we can use the anti anti CD twenties, infliximab. However, I I I, I usually don't prefer uh, having that if the patient having a central nervous system involvement, um, because then might carry a risk, a further risk of demyelination. So this is a study that showed how the antibodies and the Jogren syndrome can be overlapped with the with multiple uh, sclerosis. And if we can if we can appreciate here with the different titers, their contribution with patients in MS um, uh, disease, and at the same time, they found four 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 of the patients they have the positive SSA, and they didn't have any symptoms to suggest uh, Jogren syndrome. However, half of them, we had um, a, a positive findings on the lip biopsy. Moving to another case, um, which I have it here, um, uh, a, a five-year-old that she was evaluated in the clinic and I inherited her with the impression of multiple sclerosis. This patient had a numbness in 1997 on her right side of the body. And in 2004, she had a trigeminal neurology. And in 2007, by the time that she was evaluated, uh, she had an, a nausea, vomiting, and diplopia, and imbalance. And an, a, the, a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis was given, and she was started in glutamate acetate. The, the same year, she had another flare-up of trigeminal neuralgia. And in 2010, she had again a diplopia and numbness on the right side of her body for six months. And... She did. She opted out from having steroids, and by 2013, the patient decided to stop the glutamate acetate, and she she lost her follow up. Uh, although she had another attack of the imbalance, and in 2020, when you had the patient again, and the and the practice she was assessed after lost for follow up for seven years, was presented with parparesis also for uh, three months. So when I tracked her images back in 2007 and 8, I can appreciate here the high, the patchy high signal intensity lesion in the brain stem, and the rest of the brain uh, imaging by that time she had uh, there was no no a lot of lesion except just acute periventricular lesions uh, that it's not really the the um, and it's it's typical in their geography. The topography is slightly different from what we see. Uh, we uh, uh, reviewing the the, um, the 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 legions, uh, the the patchy region, which is really atypical, 
and and reviewing the symptoms, we can we can notice here that the patient and, and her MRI spine is normal. If we can evaluate or having another look on the on the symptoms, they are typical, they are identical. If you see the patient, she is um, having the same symptoms. She's relapsing with the same symptoms, and this has really raised a, um, a suspicious for me about sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis when they relapse, they relapse with the same lesion. It's different from multiple sclerosis. Uh, when they relapse, it can be in the same uh, location, anatomical location, but usually it's in a different location. I call it, it is relapsing in situ. It's in the mean the patients remain relapses, remain relapsing, and all the relapses is the same uh, location. So um, I updated her images, it showed the same lesion that she had, the, the, the periventricular lesions disappeared and she had um, uh, an enhancement in the brain stem uh, lesions. We moved for this, uh, the um, uh, spinal tab, which showed uh, systematic uh, lugoclonal bands, not the intrathecal. They were matching with the serum and the CSF and I requested a CT chest for her and it came back suggestive there might be a signs of sarcoidosis. Her ACE level was 153 and I referred her to our colleagues and the and the um, uh, and the sarcoidosis clinic, uh, which they proceeded with biopsy, it was not really conclusive. However, their impression that we are still dealing with a possible um, um, uh, sarcoidosis. So we are having the multiple sclerosis and sarcoidosis. Both both entities can overlap, and at the same time, the I would like to share this this study that they looked into patient that. Either they have the multiple sclerosis and the, the, with the overlap of the sarcoidosis. And maybe I would like to focus on the findings that we have uh, and, and this patients that PET scan wa was showed really involvement in 74% of the cases. And CCF analysis showed lymphocytosis and elevated protein. And the, the oligoclonal bands were positive, the intrathecal were positive only and 3%. And none of the CSF analysis showed high uh, ACE levels. And maybe it's, it's worth to mention that isolated neurosarcoidosis can present only in 17% with the, uh, with the patients without any other um, uh, symptoms. So sarcoidosis really is a great imitator. It can, it can, it can mimic anything. The lesions can be similar to MS, they can be similar uh, to tuberculosis, uh, they can be really um, 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 uh, tricky and um, um, doesn't have any, uh, any a specific pattern, except maybe for the brain stem and for the myelopathy, uh, which is showed a trident sign, I'll come to that in, in a couple of minutes. So the commonest neurological manifestation would be the cranial neuropathy, for uh, neurosarcoidosis. Uh, and we have the aseptic meningitis, the parenchymal involvement, but the myelopathy is contributing around from five up to 25%. Uh, Those are examples of the of neurosarcoid involvement lesions in the, in, the, um, um, uh, in the brain parenchyma, just to identify how the, the disease is really behaving in a different way. Um, and this is another example. This doesn't really look like a, a, a lesion that indicating a demyelination. Um, further examples, and we're having this lean, linear enhancement, which can be also found in the GFAP um, uh, encephalopathy. So the, the, uh, the long extensive myelitis and neurosarcoidosis um, can really be similar to a lot of long extensive myelitis examples for the neuropatchet, for the NMO, for the MOG. Uh, the axial cut it's a, my, would be really helpful. And we can appreciate here because of the subpail enhancement in the, um, in the myelitis and neurosarcoidosis, it gives the, the, this pattern of the trident sign. And we can, found this, we can find the same in the brain stem. Uh, legions, it showed the same pattern of the trident uh, sign. Definite diagnosis, probable diagnosis, or possible diagnosis, 
as really if we are having uh, the nerve tissue biopsy, confirm the neuropsychoidosis. If not, so then having the probable uh, diagnosis with the, with the uh, CNS involvement, um, a positive CT scan or PET scan, and the elevated ACE level, and this patient remain within that uh, category along with the CSF uh, findings. Those are examples for the long term, uh, the first line and second line treatment for neurosarcoidosis. And again, I want to echo that I, I, I like to avoid uh, tin factor inhibitors because this might, along with the infliximab, they might have the, the, the might trigger a further demyelination in the, uh, in the brain. Uh, moving to another case was a 23-year-old female that she's diagnosed with systemic lupus within a couple of uh, weeks ago, and she's maintained on 50 grams of prednisone. She was uh, brought to the ER with a of insomnia for four days, agitation, hearing loss, uh, hearing voices for three days. CCF analysis was unremarkable, normal MRI brain, there was no infectious um, um, uh, underlying the, the, in, the, in the CCF analysis, and her antibodies showed the antidepressant stranded positive, NMDA positive, and ESR uh, was 13. She was treated with um, um, uh, uh, high dose of a steroid with the impression that maybe you are dealing with the cell cerebritis, and the, the patient become more agitated with inappropriate laughing. Steroid was stopped and she was maintained in symptomatic treatment and she recovered within uh, two weeks. So having the neuropsychiatric systemic lupus manifestation is very important that how we would differentiate if we are dealing with a steroid um, 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 induced abnormal behavior or if we are dealing with neuropsychiatric um, systemic lupus. Hearing uh, he, uh, the, the auditory hallucination it's indicating an, a steroid um, uh, induced encephalopathy, while the, the visual hallucination might be favoring more the neuropsychiatric symptoms with the systemic lupus. Other examples for the uh, headache would be a common symptoms, and uh, besides the behavior changes and seizure only contribute 10% in uh, systemic uh, lupus. Uh, the the again the the um, the the dilemma of associated um, uh, other antibodies the systemic lupus can be associated with almost hundred asymptomatic uh, antibodies including the antiphospholipid the NMDA and the NMO and the uh, MOG. Those are examples of the uh, systemic lupus involvement in the brain. Might have a press like picture. We have the, myeli the myelopathy, uh, might be long extensive, uh, the vascular insults, and the uh, uh, hypophysiotic uh, involvement as well. Uh, moving to um, uh, the last case, I think, uh, 26 year old that she was presented with left optic neuritis. Uh, recovered with high dose of steroid and uh, with previous history of numbness on both hands intermittently, and she has dry eyes and headache and fatigue, and she didn't have any other uh, symptoms suggestive of rheumatological disease, and a tremor test was unremarkable. CCF analysis showed um, a lymphocytic pattern, positive olecranal bands, and she had uh, a positive antibodies that might be uh, indicating that we're dealing with a Jogarin uh, syndrome. If, we, if this is her MRI of the brain, it showed high signal intensity regions. They are subcortical. They are atypical in their geography, really, for um, um, for um, uh, multiple sclerosis. And her NMO turns to be uh, positive despite the association uh, with the positivity and the in the serological markers for Jogren syndrome and the symptom that she had for the dry eyes and the headache and the fatigue. And this is raising another uh, dilemma with the, the serological associations with the NMO uh, and can be up to 25% in the, N, the, the ANA, the anterior row up to 15%. And oligoclonal bands can be positive 
and around uh, 15 up to 50 early angiogren syndrome. So oligoclonal bands, although it is it is um, um, it is helpful in diagnosing multiple, multiple sclerosis, but it's not specific. It is sensitive, but it's not specific only for multiple sclerosis. It can be associated with other um, uh, diseases. Those are examples for the uh, for the antibodies that can be associated with the uh, NMO. And uh, going back to the McDonald's criteria for multiple sclerosis. So when people ask me why you move to the multiple sclerosis specialty, I think I found my passion as a foodie person in the McDonald's criteria. McDonald's criteria can help us diagnosing multiple sclerosis, but all or the majority of the of the uh, practitioners they forgot they forgot a, a, a very important statement and the McDonald's criteria for multiple sclerosis after exclusion of other mimics relapsing pattern is not a specific for multiple sclerosis all the cases that I presented the majority of them they had a relapsing pattern the patient had different uh, neurological manifestations at different timeline but this is not, it raised the concern of relapsing or remitting multiple sclerosis, but it's not exclusively for, um, um, for uh, to diagnose multiple sclerosis. Being vigilant and um, uh, with, the, with the clinical manifestation for dealing with atypical symptoms, not really suggestive of MS, we have to be vigilant to make sure that we are not dealing with an entity. Multiple sclerosis is a lifelong diagnosis. And once, somebody got the label of the diagnosis, it is so difficult that somebody else can really change the diagnosis. In addition, um, uh, Solomon and his group a couple of years ago in the US, they, went, they, went, they had a study, it's published um, a couple of years ago and presented in the American Academy in the, in, the, uh, uh, the, in the plenary session that 25% of the MS patients diagnosed in the M and MS clinics in the United States, they were not really a multiple uh, sclerosis. Um, some other features that in the imaging that would be helpful, differentiating MS from other uh, disease entities, a central vein sign, if you can see here how uh, this, uh, it's very high in involvement in the MS compared to other um, uh, autoimmune or other inflammatory uh, diseases. Um, I'll stop here and uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention. I think Dr. Azam, you are mute. All right, my apology. Uh, technical difficulty after uh, two years of using, actually two and a half years of using Zoom. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Aslam, for uh, this uh, great uh, presentation on a topic uh, that uh, many of us uh, to learn a lot about. Uh, I find it really uh, intriguing how people get attached to their diagnosis of MS, and uh, you know if they have to be changed, it becomes really difficult. Um, again, for everyone, if you have a question, please put it in the Q and A uh, section. And if you have your, uh, if you want to bring up your question in uh, person. Uh, Please raise your hand and I will bring you in. There's a, a, a question from uh, Dr. Graham Jones related to uh, the possibility of genetic testing to sort out uh, uh, the rheumatological diseases, neurological diseases, uh, similar to what we do in neuromuscular disorders. Uh, any comments on that one? Well, this is an interesting thought. Um... Um, I'm not sure, like, uh, really, if there is like any genetic background in the rheumatological disease. Maybe our rheumatology co colleagues, the rheumatology colleagues, would uh, would address that better than me. Okay, and not if uh, we have anyone who would like to comment on that. I don't see any uh, raised uh, hands. 
back to I mean you, you commented on the uh, on the difficulty to change an MS diagnosis from the public perspective. Uh, what, what any thoughts around that? Like why this is so like a, people are attached to that diagnosis once they're given a diagnosis and later on being replaced by another diagnosis, which is probably the correct one. Well, um, I think I think the the, um, the the main component of the difficulty is that, and then we can't really blame patients that they establish their life in different aspects based on a given diagnosis, uh, either socially, financially, um, the even their jobs. Uh, so, and especially if they have that for years, and you you and even starting on medications. Um, it is, it is, it's multifactorial. It is, a, it would, it's really a challenging situation, not only for the patients, but even for physicians. And I think the, the, uh, the, the necessity for multidisciplinary team uh, for such cases with the, from the neurology side, from the rheumatology side, I know our colleagues are running a similar uh, clinic for the vasculitis, which is uh, one of the um, 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 most useful clinics or collaboration and HHSC and or in the Department of Medicine. Um, but I think the, the, the challenges, the ambiguity of the symptoms, the, um, the, 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 the sensitivity for the serology markers, for the, for the symptoms themselves, and the getting the, the, um, the, the collaboration between colleagues and addressing that with patients um, would be very, very useful. So do you, do you see this as a potential? We talked about the combined clinic of, uh, of vasculitis and there's a lot of interest about these uh, multiple specialty clinics that address really complex diseases that are difficult to diagnose and manage. Do you foresee a, a, a future uh, clinic uh, in between, between your specialty and expertise and rheumatology happening in uh, our centers? Well, I would love to. Uh, I know that our colleagues are running a separate entity for vasculitis. But I would love to, to collaborate with our rheumatology colleagues that we can uh, establish um, uh, a clinic with the CNS inflammations um, and uh, combining the rheumatology experts from, from uh, HHCH. And, and I know that this is one of the um, area of, of excellency here in the Department of Medicine. We have great rheumatology colleagues and their input and have the chance really to discuss with a couple of them about some of the patients and sharing the inputs is really uh, helpful and useful for the patient care and at the same time for for um, um, uh, for the um, for physicians as well we we learn from each other okay that's uh, that's fantastic uh, dr uh, shosha i don't see any other uh, questions uh, listed uh, in the q and a uh, and others one just popped up uh, dr uh, or Sammy is asking, some patients with sarcoidosis may even have some of the most uh, trivial skin lesions, example, skin stags and, and biopsy then show non pisiating granulomas. Uh, has this been uh, looked into patients with neurosarcoidosis? Well, this is um, um, uh, an, a nice question. And I'm not really sure um, if, the, um, if the skin biopsy was looked in patient with isolated uh, neurosarcoidosis. It's um, an important point, and I will look into that and get back to you, Dr. Bresson. Fantastic. Well, uh, it's been a, a great review, Dr. Shusha. I, uh, some good discussion. I would uh, uh, have the opportunity to give people some a few minutes uh, back this morning, and uh, I yes. wish everyone a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, and have a good one, everyone.